Today's read aloud is The Poppy Lady, Moyna Bell Michael and Her Tribute to Veterans by Barbara Elizabeth Walsh, paintings by Lane Johnson. Prologue. Moyna Bell Michael looked forward to summer vacation when she returned home from her third year of boarding school in 1885. All appeared normal on the family plantation. Her two brothers were off fishing in Indian Creek and her four sisters were busy helping her mother prepare for the big 4th of July barbecue. But Moyna soon found that things were far from normal in the close-knit community of Good Hope, Georgia. In the 20 years since the surrender, families who had lost everything in the Civil War were still unable to recover their losses and start over. And while Moyna had been away, things had gotten worse. Drought had ruined the cotton crops, so people had little money. The children in the community couldn't even attend school. There was no money for a teacher. Moina's mother came up with a plan. From an early age, Moina was determined to learn. She had read the complete works of Shakespeare and Byron. Now, at age 15, she was well-educated. Perhaps she could teach the neighbor's children. The thought interested Moina. At her mother's suggestion, she cleaned out a slave's log cabin, abandoned on the plantation, and set up school with two of her sisters, one brother, and a few local children. On that first day, Moina began class with a verse from the Bible, an inspiring song and prayer. Moina believed anything was possible if you did your best and followed through. Throughout her life, she often relied on her favorite motto, Whatsoever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. March 1917. German U-boats had sunk another American ship, and the nation was outraged. Would the president call for war? Would Congress agree? Moina Bell Michael prayed not. She had been touring Europe when war first broke out in the summer of 1914. But now, bomb craters, trenches, barbed wire barriers, and battlefields covered the beautiful countryside, visions that still made her shudder. April 1917. The paper boy wheeled his bicycle across the University of Georgia's normal school, slamming on his brakes when he reached Moina. Moina snatched the Athens banner away from him, struck by the thundering headline, Wilson asking for war. Moina slowly climbed to the top of the dormitory steps and held out the newspaper for all to see was striking how different personalities reacted to the sight of that headline as war began hammering against the home door of every American. Moina knew that war would mean, Moina knew what war would mean to the college girls. She was their teacher and foster mother. Their brothers, their sweethearts were of war service age. Some of their fathers were. Moyna promised she would let them know as soon as the President and Congress reached a decision. All night, Moyna called the Athens banner. Each time she was told to be patient. The President was still talking to Congress. At 10.30 p.m., she called again. Tell the young ladies to say their prayers, to go to bed, and to sleep. The frustrated editor replied when news broke, an extra edition would be delivered to campus and into Moina's hands. But sleep was out of the question. On campus, Moina looked to the stars and moon, bright on this clear springtime night, and breathed the scent of white cape jasmine blossoms. She thought of the boys at the university. She offered all to God, if only he would spare them. She thought of boys throughout the country. 
if only she could go in their place. Before dawn, the addition finally arrived. Moyna read Wilson's inspiring plea to defend democracy, defend the rights of small nations, nations, defend the freedom of the seas. America was going to war. Moyna vowed to do everything she could for the soldiers, to remember them. Moyna knitted socks and sweaters, rolled bandages for the Red Cross, and when enlisted friends and students came to say goodbye, she gave them a little remembrance to take overseas. But Moyna wanted to do more. She delivered books, magazines, and candy to their camps nearby. She and friends invited soldiers home for dinner. And I felt privileged to give my best welcome to these lads in my country's uniform. And when it was time for them to leave, Moyna went to the train station to see them off. And my heart was thrilled with the pride for their bravery, courage, and cheerfulness. They were so young, they were so innocent of the dangers they were to face. But Moyna needed to do even more. To become a canteen worker for the YMCA and help soldiers overseas seemed perfect. She could listen about home and family and serve food to men on leave from the battlefronts. In the fall of 1918, her appointment approved, 49-year-old Moyna headed for New York City and the training program at the Y headquarters at Columbia University. She successfully completed the course, but was told she was too old to go overseas. Moyna refused to give up, but what could she do now? help the soldiers before they left for the war. Moyna set up a desk in the basement of Columbia's Hamilton Hall, where soldiers, sailors, Marines, and secretaries came during their free time. Every day brought privileges to serve men and women going overseas, each to face the submarine-infested Atlantic and the gas, bombs, and shrapnel of the battlefronts. But as winter approached, the large room turned gray and gloomy. The soldiers deserved a brighter, more comfortable place. Moira knew what to do. With her small salary, Moina bought fresh flowers and placed them throughout the room. More soldiers came to read and to write. Others came to spend time with family, friends, and sweethearts. So often they would hang about near the desk waiting for a bit of attention, and Moyna was happy to look at photographs, listen to letters, and share the latest hometown news. But she needed to do even more. One Saturday morning, a soldier left a magazine at her desk. Moyna turned to a marked page to find, We Shall Not Sleep by Lieutenant Colonel John McRae, a Canadian physician. She had read the poem many times, but she read it again, touched by McRae's tribute to the soldiers he could not save on the battlefields of Flanders. The poem was most strikingly illustrated in color. Spirits of soldiers floated above the battleground covered in white crosses and bright red poppies. There were no names on the crosses, no memory of who rested beneath the red poppies, and Moyna knew what she had to do. She read the last verse slowly. Take up your quarrel with the foe, to you from failing hands we throw. The torch be yours to hold it high, and if ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders' fields. To Moyna, it seemed as though the silent voices again were whispering. She thought of friends and students and the soldiers at the Y and knew she could never forget them. Moyna turned over an envelope and wrote a pledge ending with a promise. 
When she finished, Moyna looked up at three war workers standing by her desk. On behalf of everyone, they had come to repay her for her kindness. She shared both poems with the men. Impressed, they shared them with others. Soon, Moyna was surrounded by men wanting poppies of their own to honor their buddies sleeping now among the poppies of Flanders fields. Moyna knew just what to do. With their $10 check, she announced, I'll buy red poppies. I shall always wear red poppies, poppies of Flanders fields. Moyna went poppy hunting on the streets of New York. It never occurred to me the difficulty I would have in finding artificial poppies of Flanders fields in the novelty shops of New York City. At last, in Wanamaker's department store, she found one large and 24 small red silk poppies. Moyna pinned one on her cloak collar and hurried back to the Y. It was evening and the room was quiet. Moyna placed the large red poppy in the vase on her desk and handed out 23 smaller ones to the men and women leaving soon for France. She wa watched as they pinned them on their uniforms. Still, Moira needed, Moyna needed to do even more. She would not stop until every American wore a poppy to remember the soldiers. Always. Epilogue. Af two days after Moyna bought the 25 poppies, World War I ended. Parades and celebrations welcomed veterans home. Moyna was joyously elated. I had seen them go away by the thousands, and they were coming back by the thousands. But eventually, Americans wanted to forget the horrors of war and get on with their lives. It wasn't that simple for veterans. Trying to reclaim their jobs, they found that women who had filled their positions weren't willing to step aside, and bosses forgot promises to hire them back. This upset Moyna especially as she taught classes for disabled servicemen at the University of Georgia. Some were wounded or suffered the lingering effects of poison gas. Unable to work, they couldn't support themselves or their families. Once again, Moyna realized that she must do something. What if the poppy could be more than a tribute to soldiers who didn't return? What if it could, be, it could benefit returning servicemen and women and their families in need? Moyna spent every spare moment and all the money she could save urging groups to adopt the Flanders Fields Memorial Poppy to honor and support the veterans. Finally, her persistence paid off. Several national and international veterans organizations adopted the poppy as their memorial flower, and the message traveled overseas. People donated their hard-earned nickels, pennies, and dimes in exchange for a poppy. Millions of dollars were raised for veterans, war widows, and orphans, and Moyna affectionately referred to the small red blossom as a miracle flower. Before long, the unemployed and disabled veterans in American hospitals made and distributed the poppies. Each flower petal had to be twisted and fastened to a stem. Hard work for hands and fingers crippled by war wounds, but good mental and physical therapy. Moyna became known as the Poppy Lady. She re received recognition and awards from around the world, but it was nothing comparing, compared to seeing her dream to help the soldiers come true. When Moyna died at the age of 74, a military funeral was held in her honor at the First Baptist Church of Athens, Georgia. Young soldiers from the University of Georgia and the American Legion stood guard over their poppy lady. Fastened to the tip of their bayonets was a bright red poppy. Across the nation, veterans mourned the loss of a dear friend. They made 3,223 poppies, wove them into a blanket, and placed their gift on Moyna's grave. Almost a century has passed since that day at the Y when she first handed out 23 red silk poppies. Still, their message lives on.
During the weeks before Memorial Day and Veterans Day, veterans stand outside stores and distribute poppies, raising millions of dollars for other veterans and their families. At schools, poppy poster contests are held, and proud junior members of the American Legion Auxiliary and Ladies Auxiliary to the Veterans of Foreign Wars are voted poppy princesses. Each time we wear a red poppy, we thank the men and women who gave so much for our country's freedom. We promise to remember them always. Here's some more information. You can pause the video and read through it. There's an author's note, a legacy of Moina Bell Michael, and some acknowledgments.